In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wow, I felt like I was up here for like a mini sermon. I'm going to excuse myself. Okay. No, I'm, I'm not prepared. <laughs> you're, not, <laughs> you're always prepared. You got the Holy Spirit, mama. Amen. Good morning, family. Man, y'all are sleepy. It's okay. We'll wake up. I got you. Seems off. I need a new one of these. My birthday's coming up. Can you get me a new one of these? Just kidding. I am content with what I have. <laughs> Jara. Right? Come on. Hey, real quickly, uh, I want to, we, we have more announcements, but um, VBS, right? Yes, VBS uh, is coming quickly, right? This is the last week of June, June 24th through the 28th from 3 to 6, Monday through fi- Friday. This is our second year doing it. We partner with the SDA Church, and uh, it's been a beautiful thing. It was, a, it was very fruitful, um, and, and the kids enjoyed it, and we got VBS songs stuck in our heads still. Um, that we're, now we'll get new ones as, as of this next coming week. But uh, this is the last day to sign up. And so if you have a son or daughter or nephew or niece or granddaughter or grandson that you've been thinking about, uh, a neighbor, whatever it may be, uh, we're going to close signups at the end of today. We already have um, over 70 kids signed up. Um, we were going to cap it at 90. We will still allow more, but there's still more people like, oh, yeah, we got to sign up. we got to sign up. We have lots of volunteers. It's going to be an amazing time. And so this is the last day to sign up so we can plan accordingly because all, y- all y'all know that today is June 9th, and that's 15 days. Oh, my gosh. VBS starts in 15 days. Anyway, today is the last day to sign up for that. Um, <clears throat> and you can sign up at theotherchurch.org. Uh, okay, so Father's Day is next weekend. All right, good. I know my wife said Father's Day is next weekend, but we'll see how I talk about Mother's Day next year. I'm going to hold that in. I'm going to hold. No, I'm not. I'm forgiving. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But hey, Father's Day is next week, and I just want to say that you're going to want to be here. Whether you're dad or not, you're going to want uh, to be here. Uh, Dads, your wish might be to skip church for Father's Day, uh, but I encourage you to get your butt here because you're going to want to be here. We have a gift for every dad. Uh, We're going to do Elevate Family Picnic afterwards at the park. Uh, We're going to play flag football. We're going to have a watermelon eating contest. We're going to get messy because it's probably going to be over 100, so we got to put our face in watermelon, right? That's just what we do. I know that's what y'all want to do. So be here. And also, there's one more thing. Another reason, I'm not going to tell you all of it, but I'll give a little hint. We're going to do something that you've probably never seen or heard of a church doing to activate what we've been talking about last week and what we're going to talk about today, and and that's generosity. Now look, dads, I'm going to charge you to lead the way in this. It's not going to cost you anything financially. I'll just say that you're going to want to be here to see what we are going to do as a church body um, to, again, activate what we've been talking about the past two weeks and get into our community and let the community see what the body of Christ does. Amen? And that's all I'm going to tell you. It's really cool. It's a vision we've had. It's something we've been wanting to do for a very long time, uh, and we're going to do it. So come and be here next week. Amen? All right, all right. So last week... Many of y'all know that we started a a series, Money Talks. Uh, We talked about um, earning and saving God's way versus the world's way. This week, we're going to kind of go the same angle, but talking about spending and giving with God's way versus the world's way. And and I was thinking about this earlier. I was praying about it. And I really want to encourage you to lean in. I really want to encourage you to allow your heart to be open to hear what God speaks to you. We are all in different seasons Um, But we are all here together for a purpose. You are sitting in that chair for a reason. I believe that God brought you, whether it's your first time here or you've been coming to this church and this is your church. So I encourage you to lean in. And the way I thought about this is like I understand money is a hard topic in general, and it's a really hard topic in church. It's hard to preach and teach about it. It's hard to talk about it in general, right? Because immediately you hear that, you're like, la, 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 right? We don't want to hear that. Sometimes it's Holy Spirit gifts. I don't want to hear about it because I don't understand it. La, 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 I don't want to hear it. Submitting to my husband. I don't want to hear that, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a husband loving my wife like Jesus loved the church. No, I don't want to hear it. Sometimes there's different topics, right? But it's all the whole counsel of God that we are to take, amen? And so, so imagine, you know, that Jesus had disciples. He had more than 12. He had followers. Many of them left him. Why? Because they got uncomfortable with what he was teaching. They got uncomfortable with what he was doing. They got uncomfortable with what he was saying. And sometimes that's us even now. 
as the church, we're like, we're, I'm uncomfortable, so I'm going to leave or not show up or do this or roll my eyes, whatever it may, may be. And I want to say, think about being that disciple then that had the opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus and be taught, but yet they turned away because it got uncomfortable. So I am not Jesus by any way, shape, or form, right? I try and strive to be Christ-like, but I will tell you that I am led by the Holy Spirit as best I can, and this is what the Holy Spirit has us talking about as a church body. So please, I encourage you to lean in, see how the Lord speaks to you, and be open to what God is saying to you and putting on your heart. Amen? That wasn't too hard. We're good. Uh, 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 okay, I got you. It's all good. Let's go ahead and pray and set our heart toward the Lord. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the breath in my lungs. I thank you for the blood flowing through my veins. Thank you that I am blessed to have a family. I'm blessed to have the family of God around me. I'm blessed to be right here, right now, where you have placed me, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here, Lord. Here we are with a heart postured toward you, a heart softened, ready to receive a word in season. Lord, so speak to us, speak to us, Lord God, today, and we will obediently follow your lead to ultimately exalt your name on high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, okay, so there's a word. This word is called squander. You guys heard of the word squander? Right? And and to squander means to spend extravagantly or foolishly. And many of us, maybe you want to admit it, but have been there. I've definitely squandered, right? Right? I've been there. And squander is not a word we ever see used in marketing a product, right? Can you imagine marketing a product with the word squander? Like a retail store says, come and waste your money here. We're the best place to waste your money. Or or, or imagine in real estate, selling homes. We've got a lot of realtors in this city, probably some in here, right? Imagine if a realtor marketed a property, buy this property, it's a great money pit opportunity, right? To squander your money here. Or even automakers, right? Some car dealers should, should say this up front. Give us your money and we'll give you something that will fall apart, quickly become obsolete, and require even more money to maintain. Come squander your money. Can you imagine if that's how they marketed, right? That kind of language would definitely not sell a product. But as with a lot of things that we buy, that's what will happen eventually, right? And so why do we squander money? Let's look at how Isaiah 55 puts it. Isaiah 55 two says this, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. You see, God has a different invitation for us when it comes to how we use our money, and that is spend it wisely, right? Spend it wisely. Money itself, we talked about this last week, money itself is not evil. Uh, Besides earning, saving, and giving, money is also used for spending. It is a tool, right? And, And the key is, as many of us know, and many of us are learning, many of us have learned, the key is not to overindulge. Or, or, or squander, right, but you, to use money with discretion, discretion, excuse me, which is a habit that goes completely against what society teaches us, our consumer-driven culture that we live in, right? And, and if you remember last week, uh, I talked about John Wesley briefly. We talked about his financial principles, um, and I referred to him. I didn't give him much context. If you know, John Wesley is uh, an English or was an English cleric, a theologian, Uh, an evangelist who was a leader of a revival movement within the Church of England, which eventually birthed the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church has changed a lot now from what it was that he, from when he started it, but the Methodist Church was birthed out of that revival led by John Wesley. And and Wesley called upon the church in his time um, to spend only on the basics. Uh, time, and, and that was in the 1700s, right? So times have changed for sure. Yet the definition of basics, it still might be different for everyone. Even though we're in, you know, the 2000s. Oh my gosh, we're in the 2020s. Is that what you say? I don't know. We're way far ahead of the 1700s. But, but the basics could be health for some of us. Could be education. Could be groceries. Could be bills. Could be investments. Whatever it might be, basics could be different for all of us. But John Wesley's hope in saying spending money only on the basics was that if early Methodists could spend money on their essential needs, that they would have money left over to give and practice generosity. That was his desire for the church. And and, and Wesley didn't become this spiritual giant or benevolent man of God overnight. Um, His outlook on finances was shaped by memorizing the pain, memorizing the pain. 
We've all learned from memorizing the pain. What does that mean? That means when you're a kid and mom says, mom and dad says, don't touch that stove, and you touch it anyway, right? And it sizzles your hand. You learn by memorizing the pain. Or ladies, when you have your curling iron or your flat iron and you leave it on and you or you sizzle your neck or whatever it may be. You know what's funny? I brought that up and it wasn't even in my notes about the curling iron. And my sister was talking to me afterwards. She's like, you were talking to me. She had a band-aid around her finger. She burned her finger on her curling iron. So I'm like, well, the Lord is, works in mysterious ways. But, but we know memorizing the pain. We've all experienced it, right? It's a painful memory that is created in a short instance or incident, right? And and in memorizing the pain, the result is that we will do anything possible to avoid that painful situation again. We will do anything possible to avoid it, right? And so John Wesley's parents, they had, um, they had 19 children and he grew up in a big family, right? And, and, and he actually, they actually lost or experienced the pain of losing nine of those children at childbirth. So he grew up in a family of 10. And for him, that pain, that memorizing the pain was, was seeing what his family endured when he was growing up that he wanted to avoid. He wanted to avoid that poverty, that financial situation. And, and his dad, who was Samuel Wesley, he didn't make a lot of money. He was a clergyman. Um, he had trouble keeping the household afloat with 10 children, right? And, and that family was constantly uh, in a state of financial turmoil, which led to his dad's arrest twice, actually, for debts that he owed. Be grateful and thankful that you don't get arrested for the debts that you owe, right? Right? <clears throat> well, I mean, I don't know, maybe if you go that extreme, but, but he was arrested twice because of his outstanding debts. And so his family, uh, his family situation, John Wesley, was the picture that he had of finances growing up. That's all he knew. And it was enough to, to motivate him and drive him to pursue further education, which eventually led to uh, teaching opportunities at Oxford University and Lincoln College in the UK. And so, so Wesley started to build his career. He started to accumulate money. Uh, and he was stacking the cash, as we say, right? Actually, it was in the UK. So he was stacking pounds, if you want to put it like that, right? It's the British pounds. Um, but he didn't want to model the poverty of his family that he saw growing up, that painful memory. Uh, But what happened is without basic budgeting skills, he soon began to, here it is, squander his money uh, on card games, tobacco, brandy, and other things, right? And it was these spending habits that led to, or actually set the stage for an encounter uh, that would change John Wesley's life forever. And there's a book that I want to read a quick excerpt out of um, by Charles Wesley White, and it's called What? Wesley preached and practiced about money. Um, and this, 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 this particular excerpt describes an unforgettable lesson Wesley experienced one day while he was at Oxford. <clears throat> and it says this, Wesley had just finished paying for some pictures to put up in his room uh, <clears throat> when one of the chambermaids came to his door. It was a cold winter day and he noticed that she had nothing to protect her except a thin linen gown. He reached into his pocket to give her some money to buy a coat, but he found that he had too little left. Immediately, the thought struck him that the Lord was not pleased with the way he had spent his money. He asked himself, will thy master say, well done, good and faithful steward? Thou hast adorned thy walls with money, which might have screened this poor creature from the cold. O justice, O mercy, are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid. Wow, he really beat himself up. He felt that it was his call in that moment to buy a coat for this woman and he couldn't do it because he spent his money on something else. And, And so Wesley never again wanted to experience that feeling of letting God or, or his brother or sisters in Christ down. And so after this painful, painful moment, excuse me, Wesley began to develop a theology and practice around money that would change his life and the early Methodist church or early Methodism. And so to begin with, Wesley, Wesley decided that he would determine the bare minimum that he needs to live off of. And his wage in that time for one whole year, his annual sal- salary was 30 pounds. That's a big salary, right? Woohoo! Can you live off 30 bucks? I don't know. But 30 pounds was his salary. He determined that his needs, to pay for his needs, would be 28 pounds. And so he would take that leftover two and he would give that away. And that was how he decided to go about this next year. So for one year, he stuck with that plan. 
right? And then he stepped into that second year of living frugally, and he took another leap of faith and continued that plan. And what happened was his income rose that second year, doubling from the previous year from 30 to 60 pounds. Even though his income went up, Wesley kept his expenses the same at about 28 pounds, giving away 32 pounds that next year. Excuse me. I was yelling Jaira too much. lost my voice. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so he doubled his income, but he kept the same expenses and gave away 32 pounds that year. And year after year Wesley's, uh, of Wesley's income growth, he continued to live on the minimum he set for himself while continuing to give away the rest until he was living off of 2% of his income. 2% of his income and giving away the other 98%. Can you imagine? You all ready to do that? Yes? Uh Uh-oh. Hey. (laughs) There's also, to bring it more to our current time, uh, there's a pastor named Rick Warren. I'm sure many of you heard. He pastors Saddleback Church. Uh, Years ago, we were at a conference there. We were talking about, he was talking about giving. Uh, I don't know exactly what he was talking about, but um, he essentially, he gives, he lives off of 9% of his income. He gives away 91% of what he takes in. Now, <clears throat> he takes in a lot of money. He's an author who's made a lot of money on books. His book was the second best-selling book of all time next to the Bible. But he still lives humbly. He still gives graciously. He drives a, an older, or he did at that time, it was like 14 years ago, but an older F-150, right? And he lived off of 9% of his income and gave away the rest of the 91%. And so John Wesley, Rick Warren, others much like us, had to fight the urge of squandering versus spending, right? Squandering versus spending. And that's what we're going to dig into uh, in the first part of today's message. And again, that is the world's money says squander me, but God's money says spend me. The world's money says squander me, God's money says spend me. If all we have belongs to God, then how we spend money should glorify God also, right? It's all his. I was going to say this at the end, but we are owners of nothing and stewards of everything. It's all his, and we're called to steward that. And so it's not just about tithing or giving 10% back to God. If we are stewarding that money wisely, the way the other 90% is spent matters just as much as what we give. And if the Lord is guiding you in your spending, some aspects of your spending will look similar to those who are around you who are also being guided by the Lord. But... Many things will be unique to the relationship that you have with God. So as with anything, and we're going to talk about this, you know, you might be aligned, you might be being led by the Lord and you're spending to the pers- with the person to your left and right, but it's going to look different for all of us. So let's make sure we stay in our lane and hear from the Lord, even when it comes to spending our money. You with me? Yes. <clears throat> all right, all right. So, <laughs> and we know, again, money is a hard topic. Financial worries are something that Christians even have been dealing with, wrestling with for centuries, and we can see it, and we just sang about it, um, but we can see it, and it comes directly from Matthew 6. Matthew 6 is where uh, we're going to read through from Jesus himself. And this is that part of that song, Jaira. Verse 25 says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? I love that verse. Stop worrying. You're not adding anything to your life. You're actually taken away. Verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. That's that line if he's going to close the lilies, right? Verse 30. If that is how God closed the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Tomorrow's got its own trouble. Stop worrying about tomorrow, family, right? But, but today, some of us are feeling those very real worries. Is there enough food to eat? Are there enough clothes to wear, shelter to live in, right? And, and still others are struggling with the pressure our culture adds to having the right clothes, to eating the right food, to eating at the right restaurants, right? And, and keeping up with those around us who have bigger, newer, cleaner houses, cars, boats, side-by-sides, whatever it may be. Either way, again, we're all in a different season. And, and we, we have made a choice to try and keep up with how our culture says we should live. And financially, we can't do it anymore. The debt adds up and, and the stuff does not make us feel any happier, any more important or any more secure. Yet, we still want more. Yeah. All right, so, so we've looked at the myths of, of consumer-driven culture and how it feeds us. And now let's explore some ways we as believers or as Christ followers can follow Jesus in, in the midst of this consumer-driven culture. I've got four points for us to kind of focus in on here. Uh, number one is resist comparing what you have to others. Resist comparing what you have to others. President Theodore Roosevelt said, and you've probably heard this before, comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. <clears throat> it's like just when you're starting to feel good with what you have, you look over your shoulder and you see somebody else has the newer model. Or somebody else on your right or your left has the next best thing, right? We love to compare ourselves to others and our peers and our neighbors and say, I don't have as much as so-and-so. And I've said it before, but in this culture out here, man, everybody's grass is perfect. The grass is green. It's mowed perfect. Sometimes they got those diagonal lines. And you're like, how in the world do I make my grass look like that? Or you got Mr. or Mrs. Smith uh, next door washing their boat or their side-by-side -side or their RV. And you're like, I want what they have. They have more than me. They have an, not only do they have a three-car garage, they got an RV garage. I wish I could have one of those. We love to do that, right? We love to compare to those to our left and our right and our neighbors. But have you ever been on a mission trip to a third world country? Maybe you have. Maybe you know someone you have. Maybe you've heard stories. But so often as believers, as Christians in a first world country, we go to the third world country thinking, I'm going to go and I'm going to help these people and I'm going to bless these people and I'm going to do so much good. But in reality, the trip ends up helping us who go on those mission trips even more, right? Experiencing life in a third world country, what it does is it gives us a wake up call. We see the joy and the freedom these people have even without excessive wealth. And then it's like, oh, we're convicted, right? We're convicted about our own accumulation of money and possessions. But what happens? Eventually, it's back to life as usual. We get back around our peers, our neighbors. We're bombarded with constant advertisements, right? We forget our disgust with the material possessions. We become desensitized again. We all too quickly conform to the world around us. So resist comparing what you have to others. I want to stop one second before we move on to number two. I'm not saying that those things are bad or negative, right? We're talking about squandering. If you're putting yourself in a bad position just to keep up with the person next to you, that's probably not. But if God has called you and you've been blessed and you're ab living abundantly, by all means, enjoy the fruit of your labor. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> all right, number two, rejoice in what you do have. Rejoice in what you do have. Here comes that word, contentment. Oh, man. Right? It's not a natural trait. I talked about this last week. It has to be learned. And guess what? I am learning or relearning or both right now this very thing in my current season. Yesterday, I was in our backyard as I do. I, I like to walk barefoot in our grass and pray. And many of you know we moved to a, a different house a couple weeks ago. And so I'm walking around and just praying, talking to God in the grass. And then I kind of open my eyes and as I tend to do, start dreaming and getting vision, and I'm looking at the grass. I'm like, okay, so that would be a good, actually, no. Yeah, over here would be a good spot for the pool. 
if we own this house, you know, we would put the pool here. And then uh, over here, we'll have to push that wall out so we can make room for a basketball court. That would be good, but a half court there. Uh, we're going to need an in-ground trampoline over here. And then that leaves us just enough grass here. And then I'm, I'm sitting here doing this thing, right, looking at it. And I'm thinking about the neighbor who's got a really nice pool with a water slide. And I'm like, well, if we put ours here, and I'm looking at the patio, and I stop, and I, and I can literally see the house. I'm looking at the back of the house, and the Lord says, contentment. Be content. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm content. And then I just, become, I just began to thank him. I'm like, thank you so much, Lord, that we have an opportunity to live in this house. I am very content to live in this house. This is the biggest house that our family has ever lived in. Is it the biggest house on the block? By no means. But it is the biggest house we've ever had to live in. Thank you, Lord. I'm so grateful for every part of it. But the Lord checked me. Contentment, right? Be content. He said contentment. And so guess what? Along with me, I invite you to enroll in the school of contentment today and say, God, help me learn to be content with what I have. Forgive me for jealously wanting more. Thank you for all you've already given me. Right? And you know what's really cool? Paul enrolled in the school of contentment also. Philippians 4, he says this, verse 11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. That's, that's something to strive for to be where Paul was, right? And I'll tell you what, there are only two ways to get enough. One is to continue to accumulate more and more and more, and the other is to desire less. Contentment is the key, but it's so easy to get off track. And the verses we just read from Matthew 6 tell us not to worry. Don't worry about tomorrow, right? Rejoice in the food and the clothes that we have today. And then the God will provide for our, the God who cares for us so intimately will provide for us, right? And then verse 30, I'll, I'll say it again. It says, And if God cared so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. What a good God we serve. Amen? So rejoice in what you do have. <clears throat> Number three, return the first fruits back to God. Oh, it's quiet up in here. Lock the doors. Lock the doors. <laughs> this practice when using a tenth or 10% is called tithing, right? Many of us know that. And Matthew 6.33 uh, exhorts to us to seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. The King James Version says it like this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The purpose of tithing. And this is, I'm specifically talking about giving a tenth of your earning. It's to teach you to always put God first. Right? And that is why from the very beginning here at Elevate Church, we have referred to giving. My wife just talked about it as first fruits. And this was led by the Holy Spirit. Everybody's like, you're not going to talk about tithing. You're not going to mention tithing and offering. No, the Lord said, we're going to call it first fruits. Yeah. And that's what we've done from the very beginning of launch because the Holy Spirit led us to that. And, and, and the, the tenth and tithing, it's a biblical principle. And, and there are different interpretations and teaching on this. You know, some people say, well, that's of the law and I don't live in the law, so I don't have to give a tenth. And some say, okay, well, there was a, 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 a reference of or, or evidence of a tenth before the law, so we should still live by that, and it's a principle, and so on and so forth. But guess what? That's your own Bible study on your own time and see what the Lord says to you. I'm talking about first fruits. I'm talking about being obedient to what God puts on our heart because ultimately, God doesn't need our money, but he does want our heart. And where your treasure is there, your heart will also be. So, so tithing is a way to test our own hearts. And so I have a question. Does our money possess us or are we free to give it up? Does our money possess us or are we free to give it up? Giving is an antidote to greed. Giving is an antidote to greed. What it does is it breaks the chain of materialism, right? It forces us to step out in faith and trust in God. It's defying the myth that, that more money is going to make you feel more secure. And it's saying, you know what, God, I am secure in you. You are more than enough. I trust you more than the number of dollars in my bank account. And when you get to that place, family, it is so freeing. I'm telling you, I've been on both sides, just like 
Paul, although God is continuing to teach me how to be content, I've been on both sides. But I understand giving can be scary when each month can be a struggle to stretch a paycheck, making the leap of faith to, to, to seek God first and, and give any percentage of that. Of that. It's, it's, it's scary, right? It sounds crazy. But we have to remember that the God we serve, the God who is a loving father and already knows all of your needs and my needs, we do not know what tomorrow holds, but guess what God does? And he always provides. He is faithful. Amen? <clears throat> and the enemy of your soul, Satan, he would love to hold you back with fear. But don't let him. And that's why rejoicing in what we do have and all the ways God has provided is so important, right? Rejoicing is what allows us to step out in faith and return, return a portion back to him. And we're going to talk about biblical giving in a couple of minutes, but... But, but the idea is when you plan your spending, it's important to set aside a percentage of that income for the Lord. And that's what I mean by fruits, first fruits. And I'll give, you, I'll give you an example from our personal life. Not only is giving biblical, but it's something that my wife and I have experienced the fruit of in our marriage from the very beginning. There's, there's a time, uh, and, I, and, and, and you guys have probably heard the story before, but I was in a season of rebellion to God where a doubt of that he wouldn't provide and, and seeking, and, and I, would, I would walk into church at Elevate Church in California, and I would hold on to the, to the seat back and not lift my hands and not sing the songs and look there with an angry look on my face because why? I put two and two together, and we weren't giving at the time she wanted to. I said no. And, and, and why? Because I had a problem with my pastor, but ultimately I had a problem with myself. Yeah. I had a hardened heart. Wow. And so I'd listen. I listened. And we were still faithful to go to that church and, and sit under that pastor and let the Lord work. It wasn't easy. I'm sure she had to drag me there with an angry face often. And we were not giving. And, and I would be, my pastor would talk and I'd be like, wah, 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 right? And I wouldn't listen. And I'm like, he's wrong, he's wrong. Try to find out where he's wrong, right? Now look, I got a great relationship with that same pastor. He's still our pastor. He's our spiritual covering. It was my issue. Yeah. It was a hardened heart. And I want to tell you what, the God, what God told me. At that time, uh, the money I was making was cash, right? When I would work, it was cash. And so God showed me this, this vision and kind of instructed me in my heart to get a mason jar. And when I made that cash that day, I would come to the Lord every day and I'd say, okay, Lord, how much? So if I made two, three, four hundred dollars $400, whatever it was, take that cash and the Lord's like 20 30 40 50 whatever. Okay, I'd drop it in that mason jar, put the rest in my wallet and walk away. And that became a process. Was it easy? I'm like, yeah, woo-hoo, here's a no. Like, it was not like that. I'm just being real. It took some time. But it actually got like that. God trained my heart. As it be- each time I was like excited, all right. And whatever the Lord put on my heart, I would drop it in that mason jar, put the rest of my wallet, and then it came Sunday or wherever we were giving because we give to other organizations as well as our church overly and abundantly more than ever God could ever ask, think, than we, ah, than we could ever ask, think, or imagine God continues to provide. But God would give me the amount. I would do that and give it. And guess what? That, that created a separation and trained my heart. It was done. It's already done. Thank you, Lord. And he put it on my heart. Whatever he purposed in my heart, is what he trained me how to give. And so there was a heart change that happened and things began to unravel. And it was, and and then I walked in that place of freedom again and I actually started doing this again and I wasn't mad at my pastor anymore. But it was a lot of other things that happened. But in giving, it was a beautiful thing. And that's that's my journey. That was my personal journey. And for us, maybe that'll speak to you. Um, But it's important to plan and set aside what God puts on your heart. Amen? All right, so number four, refocus. Hold what you do have with an open hand. When it comes to money, we like to do this. We like to hold a grip on it, right? We like to see it stack. We like to save, which is saving is good. We talked about that last week. Watch it on Elevate Church Utah. Did you say hi to the people online? I don't think you did. Hi to the people online. Okay, let's get back to it. Um, (laughs) Refocus, hold what you do. By the way, tell us where you're watching from. Thank you. Okay. Refocus, hold what you do have with an open hand. What if in addition to giving generously back to God 10% or whatever he tells you, we gave him access to the rest of it, to the rest of our income and with all of our stuff? What if the stuff we already have was dedicated toward doing good and went toward becoming rich in good (laughs) deeds? What if our home, our car, our toys, our clothes are available to God? To bless others. What if we were truly willing to share it all? I know I've talked to many with, 
who have been blessed with homes where it didn't look possible, and they, they, they say, this is a ministry home. This is a home where we're going to have meetings, where we're going to pray for people, community groups, whatever it may be. That's what I'm talking about, the things that God blesses us. What if it looked like we were open to sharing all of that to him? What if he blesses you with a new car and you know someone that needs a ride to and from work, to and from church, whatever? Well, then you're using it for the good of the kingdom. Amen? <laughs> what if we were truly willing to share all of it, being truly stewards of everything and owners of nothing. I want to talk about Ohio. That was a weird transition, right? Is, is anyone here from Ohio? Man, we had a couple people in the first one. I know that we got Chuck uh, and um, uh, Julie, and it turns out that Tony's from, babe, Tony's from Dayton, Ohio, too. But many of you that paid attention in history class, which is not me, but I learned it later, um, you might have heard of, uh, of the great flood in Dayton, Ohio. And this was in 1913. I wasn't around, by the way. Uh, But in 1913, uh, in Dayton, Ohio, they experienced the greatest natural disaster in Ohio history. And it was March of that year uh, that a series of winter storms uh, hit the Midwest. And within three days, 8 to 11 inches of rain fell throughout the great Miami River watershed on already a saturated soil. And that resulted, excuse me, more than 90% Runoff. Yes, it's called the Miami, Great Miami River, but it is in Ohio. Just want to get that clarity. Um, there's, a, there's a school called Miami of Ohio. I don't know how that makes sense, but it's okay. Anyway, um, I guess if you live in Ohio, you want to be in Miami. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> either way, I'm glad I live where I live. Thank you, Lord. I am content with where I'm at. But anyway, so back to this, this, this flood. So the river and its tributaries overflowed. And the existing levees failed, and downtown Dayton was flooded up to 20 feet throughout the city. By comparison, the volume of water that passed through the river channel during this storm equals the monthly flow of Niagara Falls. That, think about that. <laughs> You've seen the falls, right? That's a lot of water that flowed through that city, city and it caused about $100 million worth of property damage. And it's over 400 lives were lost. Thousands of livestock were killed. But the people of Dayton, after this, were determined to prevent a flood like that from ever happening again. And the governor appointed uh, people to the Dayton Citizens Relief Commission. And then in May, remember the flood was in March. Already by May in 1913, the commission conducted a 10-day fundraiser collecting more than $2 million to fund the flood control effort. I'm talking about $2 million in 1913's money. That's a lot of money, right? Two million dollars. The community came together and raised that much money. And so the result was the construction of the Miami Conservancy District's flood control system, which to date has, well, whenever the statistic was, but has prevented flooding in this area more than 1,500 times since its completion because of the the system that they built. And if you think about it, when, when, when water has no place to go, it can be very destructive. Right? It continues to accumu- accumulate and rise, and it's got nowhere to go. And so what happens is it overflows and floods homes and businesses and can take lives, right? But water can also be life-giving. When it's allowed to overflow and run off as it goes, water can provide nutrients for growing crops. It can uh, provide feed. It can feed livestock. And it can produce life and fruit. Water needs to overflow but in healthy ways. And that's what they created with that water system, right? And our money is much the same. Just as a lot of water can be used to produce life or destroy it, so can money. When money is worshipped, it becomes blocked up and hoarded, resulting in greed. But when we allow it to overflow where it's needed, the result of that generosity is fruit and life and growth. When money is not allowed to go anywhere, it can result in damage to our own hearts and a withholding of blessing for others. The amazing thing is when money is allowed to overflow in healthy ways, just like floodwaters, there's always more than enough. And this is what the practice of giving does in comparison to worshiping money. And this is, again, a crucial topic. In the church, and it's often avoided, right? And so, with a, with a little bit, a few minutes that we have left, we're going to talk about the world's money says, worship me, God's money says, give me. 
The world's money says, worship me. God's money says, give me. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9. Verses 6 through 15. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth to encourage them to give generously as they have promised. Paul then uh, sends Titus and several, several others to go collect that offering for those in need. And he says this, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. I'm going to continue on in verse 10 in a minute, but I want to hone in on verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Has someone compelled you to reluctantly give a certain percent so that you could get to heaven, so that you could sit in church, so that you could participate in the things that that community has? Has someone told you that? If they have, that's not biblical. And I'm sorry for that. That is not of the Lord. Because it says right here, give what you have decided in your heart to give. So what is it? Does God need our money? No, but he wants our heart. It's all about our heart. So I encourage you, again, soften your heart and see what the Lord. Because, look, you can just say 10%, and I'll I'll be honest with you. Part of when I said that that with Elevate Church, we talk about it as first fruits. Because the Lord showed me very clearly, why would you limit people from giving what they want to give in their heart? What if you want to give, 20, I'll tell you what, we give more than 10%. We give more than 10% of our income. So I'm not, we're, not gonna, we're not here to limit it. It's all about what God puts on our heart and where God puts it on your heart. Amen? All right, number 10. Well, verse 10, sorry. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. On every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Guess what? It should always give glory to God. Verse 13, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God. That's what it's all about. When we do what we're called to do, others will praise God. For the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. It starts with gratitude, family. If you want to worship God instead of money and enter into this journey that we just talked about of overflowing Generosity, the best place to start is gratitude. You have to let gratitude well up in your heart. Imagine those spring rains coming down to create the Dayton flood. The water started to rise. In just that same way, we have to let gratitude rise well up in our hearts in the same way. Gratitude is a form of worshiping God, right? But focusing on our stuff or, or the lack thereof is also a form of worship. It's a form of worshiping material wealth. And that's why gratitude is so important. That's why gratitude is so powerful because it breaks the power and negativity of selfishness. It stops the downward spiral and it starts to lift you up. So I encourage you to start a practice of giving thanks. Start a practice of giving thanks. You can write it down. When you notice yourself focusing on the things that you do not have and you're inwardly focused on that, stop and start writing down the things that you're grateful for, right? It could be a spoken list instead of writing list. You could just be laying in bed, drifting off to sleep, and just thinking about and meditating on and talking to the Lord about the things that you're grateful for, right? It could be part of a spiritual practice of journaling. It could be just something you do with your family at the dinner table, the dining table. Whatever it may be, I encourage you to start a practice of giving thanks and see what God does in your heart. And we just read 2 Corinthians 9. In verse 8 it says, And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, 
having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So my question is, where has God blessed you abundantly? Where has God given you all that you need? I encourage you to let the Lord reveal that to you. Bring those things to mind. Hey, you're sitting here breathing, sitting in a comfy red chair in a beautiful part of southern Utah. I'd call myself blessed for that. Just that, right? We have to thank God for our job. We have to thank God for our financial provision. You, you should be thanking God for a season and transition if you're in between work, right? You may not have a job, but thank you for the season of transition. You, we need to thank God for the things that, that you love about your spouse, not the things that you don't like, right? We need to thank God for the joys of singleness if you're not married, right? We need to thank God for our kids, for our parents, for our neighbors. We need to thank God for the weather, even this heat, right? Or even the cold if you're from up north, even the snow, or if you're here from the crazy desert rainstorms, we need to thank God for our health, for the, uh, excuse me, for the food that God has provided. We need to thank God for the things that you are blessed to have, even when it results in more mess to clean up. Yeah. <coughs> you need to thank God for household chores that mean you have a roof over your head. Yeah. We need to thank God for homework and the ability to learn. We need to thank God for the delay. Oh, the delay. That gives you an opportunity to pause and give him thanks. We need to thank God for the economy, for the government. Still trying on that one. We need to thank God (laughs) for the world that God so loves. We need to give him thanks. Amen? (laughs) Giving is a major act of trust. And God has blessed, blessed each of us abundantly and he's supplied our needs. So let's not be an ungrateful recipient. Amen? Amen. If we're going to overflow with generosity, we have to start with giving thanks. And then we give God our trust, right? Giving is a major act of trust. It's saying, God, you know what? I trust you more than the amount of money in my bank account. It's hard to say. It's saying, I'm going to put you first, Lord, and trust you for my needs. And I know that's scary. Many Christians say yes to trusting Jesus in almost every area of their life. Except with their money. It's like the final holdout, right? God, I trust you as my Lord and Savior, but I need to keep control of my money. My money. I need to keep control of my money. Many Christians say that. Many Christians say yes to healing. Say yes to restoration. Say yes to deliverance. But it's like, I got to hold on to that money. It's one of the most common areas that we try to hold back. However, family, if we can trust God as our Savior, if we believe God is good, if we believe God is faithful, if we believe God is true, then we can trust God with when He says that giving is good. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. A tithe, as I, as I mentioned, simply means a tenth. It's also to be the first tenth that is set apart belonging to God. It's about putting God first. We worship God with our first and our best, and we trust him to bless the rest. Amen? Amen. Tithing and giving teaches us to prioritize our life around God, the the one we really want to worship. It teaches an abundance mindset. I've been talking about abundance. God's been saying abundance. God wants his church to live in abundance so that others can see what we have as the body of Christ, that our needs are provided, and say, I need, I want, I desire that. And you can point them straight to our Heavenly Father and say, come back into relationship with your Creator. That's what it's about, right? We're to live in abundance and, and giving teaches an abundance mindset and that is a mindset that the macedonian church has had and in that mindset it builds our faith in god's faithfulness right throughout our years in ministry my wife and i have never met anyone who regretted giving yeah. now 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 maybe some regretted where they gave if they found out the gift was not appreciated or wasn't used wisely but but no one was ever sorry i didn't, couldn't read my notes it all went backwards but no one we've met has ever regretted the, the, the practice of giving is, is what I'm getting at. That practice of giving has always been fruitful with people um, that we've known in ministry. And here's the crazy part about giving. We think we will miss out on our goals 
we think we're going to miss out on life experiences in general. But when we partner with God in joyful obedience, somehow it always works out and more, right? The next thing that happens when you let gratitude fill up your life is that you begin to open your heart to be generous in all areas. When the waters rise up due to heavy rain, you must give them a place to go, right? You got to give the water a place to go. After the Dayton flood, the city put in a flood control system to release the waters into various areas that could actually use the water instead of flooding, right? And as our hearts start to well up with gratitude, it's time to let them overflow in generosity around you. Money hoarded turns into destructive greed and causes damage, much like a flood. And that's why we can't worship money. When we share our financial blessings, our generosity overflows and blesses others who can in turn bless others. And with your generosity, we have to plan our generosity. Because when you give it a place to go, we have to plan our generosity. Because why? Without a plan, good intentions fall flat, right? Without a plan, good intentions fall flat. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul's writing to the Corinthian church about the Macedonians, actually. He's wanting the Corinthians to be inspired. He's wanting them to be ready because Titus and them were coming, right? And the Corinthians had already said that they're going to give. And give generously. And, and it was in part their commitment in saying we're going to give that had inspired, excuse me, the Macedonians to give so generously. And so, so Paul's colleague Titus and a bunch of others are coming to collect the offering. And the reason Paul wrote this is because he didn't want them to get there. And the Corinthians might have failed to plan for the generous gift that they had promised. You know, like the whole, I wanted to give, but I guess I ate out at Longhorns too often. Right? I wanted to give, but there was this sale that I just couldn't pass up. Or even legitimately, I wanted to give, but the car needed new tires. I wanted to give, but we've all had those excuses. I've had those excuses, right? And the Corinthians' excuses were probably a lot different than these ones, than ours. But Paul knew that the excuses would come up. And so he wrote this letter. And, and this should encourage us that when we make a plan, we can give generously with joy when it's planned. When we do not plan, that is when our commitments feel like a weight, right? I gave my example because in all honesty, it was not joyful at first. It felt like a weight, but it turned and God changed my heart. And then all of a sudden I was joyfully chucking money in a mason jar, right? It became this process and, and it's continued on ever since then. It becomes, a, it becomes joy. Why? Because I made a plan. Giving is good. It's meant to be fun. That's why it's important to plan, family. When you make your priorities the priority, your life stays in order. When you're not intentional, your best intentions do not come to fruition. It's important to plan. So, in this quiet church in southern Utah, are you all ready to really trust God? Yes. Some of you all, huh? And we're in a corporate fast right now. My wife just talked about it. We've been mentioning it. It ends on Thursday. I mean, you can fast whenever. You should fast whenever the Lord puts it on your heart. But what better time to seek the Lord and put your faith into action. See what God puts on your heart. Look, I'm praying and believing for, for breakthrough for those of us who truly put our trust in Him. We can't wait to hear the testimony of what God does in and through you as a result. And I believe that many of you here are about to see God move in your life through joyful obedience, both as you experience the blessing of giving and as you see God guide you as you stretch the rest. 2 Corinthians 9, this is verse 7. I'm, we're going back to 2 Corinthians 9. But again, verse 7 says this. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. And this is a part I want to focus on here. God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver, right? In the translation, this is funny. Exactly. The translation here of cheerful comes from the Greek word hilaron, which comes from the same root hileos, from which we get the word hilarious. I've... I've been in situations where personally all I could do was laugh out loud when the finances lined up. It was like, I, nah, I have no idea, right? Like, my math did not add up, but his math totally added up, and all I can do is laugh joyfully because my God, again, 
was faithful. I took him at his word. I take you at your word. Do you? Then give cheerfully, right? Laugh when you give. I mean, it's hilarious, right? And then you have the other side of it with the world. The world's going to think that you're ridiculous and maybe laugh at you when you live in a life of extreme generosity. But guess what? Don't stress. He's got you. Let him turn you into a cheerful or a hilarious giver, and you'll have the last laugh. Amen? Amen. So if you want to be more generous, family, you got to make it a priority. Start with giving thanks and then giving to God. A little bit of advice, don't wait till you have more money. The more you make, the harder it's going to come to part with it. If you start giving a percentage of your income now, as your income grows, so will your giving. And you won't even miss that extra money. Remember, money can either say, worship me or give me. When you give, you're helping break the bonds of greed and materialism that say, worship me. And then you become free to experience the joy of giving. So give with confidence, knowing how God has used generosity in your own life. And with the excited anticipation of how God may use it in the lives of others. Now, now I talked about in the beginning of service how to, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, next week on Father's Day, we're going to put into practice what we talked about last week and today. I will tell you a little bit more that it involves generosity and you're going to want to be a part of what we're doing next week. Now, I'm not just saying that to get you to church um, because in all honesty, if there's less of you, it'll cost us less. There's another hint. But anyway, <clears throat> we're going to put this into practice. Why? Because we want to practice what we preach and we very well do practice what we preach here at Elevate Church. I told you, my wife and I give more than 10%, overly and abundantly. We give into this church. We give into other organizations as well. And so, look, I'm not just talking about give us your money, give us your money. No, I'm telling you to seek the Lord and see where God has you to put it. If you're rooted here, if this is your church, if this is your home church, by all means, I, I believe that God wants you to give here. If you're just visiting, then seek the Lord and seek the Lord and see what he says. If you're from a different area, if you go to another church, if you don't have a church to go to, you're more than welcome to be part of this family. And I'll tell you what, this is a generous church. This is good soil. We've had opportunity to, to bless single moms. We've had opportunity to bless families. We've had opportunity to bless the community. And we are continuing to let that vision expand and get out in the community. And that's because we have a generous church. So thank you. And I encourage you, let's continue. Amen. Yeah, go ahead. Give yourselves a round of applause. So, again, I'm not just talking about one particular place. I, I know that it is God's plan for us to have freedom in that and not be weighed down by it, but to give hilariously. Amen? <laughs> Last scripture reference because I love 1 John. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out all fear. Sometimes, a lot of times with money, there's fear. Right? It's a, it's a real... It's a real step of faith and act of trust. But I encourage you to let God's love empower you and drive you as you worship God by giving generously. And what does that mean? That means paying attention to that prompting of the Holy Spirit when you feel it in your heart to buy the person lunch next to you. That you can just see it on their face, face their countenance. Or, or, or you see someone pull up and they're putting five bucks or a dollar in the gas tank. And you're like, you know what, let me fill up your tank. I wish I could remember the story. I don't have time for it. Look, look at last year when we talked about giving. Anyway, but, but, but it's following that prompting. I, I, our desire, and, and it's in our vision statement. I can't remember what it says exactly, but we will be this known body in our city. We want to be not Elevate Church Made Famous or Nick and Sogol or any of the leaders here. No, we want to be the known body who is generous. We want to be the known body who walks out miracles, signs, and wonders. We want to be the known body who walks in freedom, in joy, in patience, in love, that understands that love is a weapon. That's our desire, right? And that includes generosity, family. So I'm asking you, what is God saying to you today? What do you need to do to respond to him? Where do you feel conviction to change? God's calling each of us to live a life of abundance and in that to live financially free and to follow him in this consumer-driven culture. But that call can look different for each of us. 
It looks different for all of us. So you got to lean in and pay attention to what God is putting on your heart. I mean, I don't know. Do you need to resist comparing yourself to others? Remember, comparison is the thief of joy. Maybe you need to stop some of those streaming subscriptions or other monthly subscriptions that are just draining your bank account and you know you don't even need them. Maybe you need to cut back on the amount of time you spend scrolling through social media because that's not adding any years to your life either, right? Maybe you need to start rejoicing and thanking God for everything he has blessed you with rather than focusing on what you don't have. And with that, can you start each day this week? Maybe just put it into practice tomorrow. Wake up and thank God for three things that he's given you. Make that a practice daily and watch what it does and watch how God changes your heart. Maybe you've never taken a leap of faith to return your first fruits to God. Maybe today's the first day for you to start giving. Put your trust in God and see how he provides. Maybe you've been tithing or giving for so long it's almost automatic. So ask God what he would have you do. Does God want you to give more in this season? Maybe he wants you to give a one-time gift to some particular ministry that you used to be connected with or, or that he's been flashing before your face over and over again and he's put it on your heart. Maybe a percentage of increase where you currently give or, or a commitment of time or a commitment of your talent or your treasure, wherever it is. Let God lead you and guide you and speak to you today. Be open to it. Maybe you need to refocus and surrender the possessions to God that are possessing you. So I encourage you to make a list. You've got to put faith into action, right? Make a list of the items that you are offering up to him as the owner because you're the steward, right? We recently paid off our cars. That's awesome. And I'm like, I own this car. I got the pink slip. I don't have a car payment anymore. No, it's his. I'm stewarding this car. I got the pink slip, but I'm still the steward of it. Amen? So maybe, again, surrender, refocus and surrender the possessions to God that, that are possessing you. Make a list of the items that you're offering to him as the owner to use however he can for ministry and to build the kingdom of God. Again, we are owners of nothing, stewards of everything because it all belongs to him. But whatever it may be, the Lord is speaking. Whatever it may be, the Lord is speaking. So let's listen. And I'm going to take a moment quickly before we end service to be silent. And I want us to listen to the Lord, whether it's audibly in our mind, in our heart. And then I want you to write down one thing you feel called to do in response to God's call of freedom in your life. One thing. Text it to your spouse. Put it in your notes. Text it to yourself. Write it down, whatever it may be. Just in a moment of silence, I want us to just lean in. Feel that prompting. What is it? Again, maybe it's just you're going to go out to lunch and pay for someone's lunch. Simple as that. Maybe it's an increase in giving. Maybe it's giving into a particular ministry. Maybe it's using what he's blessed you with and surrendering all that. And you know what? God will, if he gives you vision, he will provide the provision for that. Always. He always does. And so let's take a minute to let the Lord speak. And just go ahead and, again, write that down, type it in, whatever it is, whatever God puts on your heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your plan. Thank you that you are intentional. Where you place us, whom you place us in relationship with, where you place us, how you use us. Here we are, ready and willing to be used by you. I pray that you would continue to search us, know us, renew in us a steadfast spirit. Search our heart, Lord. 
just pray for surrender. I just pray that each of us, Lord, Holy Spirit, show us what it looks like to walk out surrender, to walk out freedom, to live a life of generosity, freely, joyfully, so that we're not weighed down by the pressures of this world. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would walk out in freedom, knowing that you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Thank you, Lord, for your word, which is living and active, never returns void. Your word, which says that you are able to provide overly, abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine according to the power that works in us, Lord. And guess, guess what, family? He gets the glory in all of it through us. Lord, our desire is to give you glory, to exalt your name. Thank you for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.